Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the ITU AI and Machine Learning in 5G Challenge webinar series. My name is Thomas Baskol from the ITU, and it is my privilege to introduce today's webinar. The AI and Machine Learning in 5G Challenge is brought to you by the International Telecommunication Union ITU, which is United Nations Agency for ICTs. The mandate of the ITU is to allocate frequencies to services that uses the radio spectrum to develop standards and to assist developing countries in setting up their ICT infrastructure. This challenge is kindly sponsored by Xilinx and we are grateful for their sponsorship. The AI and Machine 5G challenge aims at creating a community that will solve network related problems using AI and machine learning. This webinar is going to be moderated by Professor Norihiro Fukumoto from the, uh, who is a uh, visiting associate professor at the University of Tokyo. And during this webinar, we have uh, four parts. The first part, uh, we are going to have the introduction of two problem statements uh, from the challenge that we hosted in Japan, which is problem statement number 16, location estimation using RSSI of wireless LAN and problem statement number 15, which is network failure detection and root cause analysis in 5G core by NFV-based test environment. And then the second part, we have two expert talks, which will discuss about machine learning for wireless LANs and advances in machine learning uh, related research for wireless communications. So at, at this point in time, I would like to invite uh, Fukumoto Sensei to introduce uh, our speakers from the Japan Challenge as well as the expert talks. Uh, hello, uh, good evening and good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for participating uh, our webinar regarding ITU Air ML in 5G Challenge. Uh, my name is Norihiro Fukumoto from the University of Tokyo. Uh, I'm acting as a moderator of this webinar, and I'm happy to introduce our activities and uh, our problem statement in Japan Challenge. Uh, here you can see the uh, agenda of this webinar. Uh, this webinar consists of two parts. At the first part, two problem masters introduce their problem statements, respectively. And the second part, two AI machine learning experts will give uh, tutorial sessions. Uh, I hope that these talks will probably be a good reference for this AI machine learning challenge. And at the first, uh, let me give the overview of ITU, uh, ITU AI machine learning in 5G challenge. Uh, in this challenge, uh, simply participants of the ITU AI machine learning in 5G challenge solve real world problems. Participants should make their teams and uh, they enable, create, train, and uh, deploy machine learning node models for communication networks. The, first edition of the challenge last year, uh, over 1,300 students and uh, professionals from 62 countries compete, competed for global recognition and prizes. This challenge is sponsored by uh, Zilinx and hosted by many organizations, as you can see. Uh, from Japan's side, Rising is hosting the problem statements uh, we will introduce today. Here is the timeline of the challenge, including some important dates. Now, uh, in the middle of July, uh, we are in the competition phase. Uh, we are competition phase uh, registration period. Participants can register your favorite problem statements by the end of August. At the, the and the deadline of the submission of the solution is the end of September. And after the deadline, ITU will evaluate the submitted solutions and uh, evaluate the best solution. And after that, the challenge will be conducted by, uh, will be concluded by uh, grand challenge finale at December. Uh, if you are interested in the problem statements introduced today, please access to the URL in this page https colon slash slash challenge dot ai for good dot itu dot int slash match. Uh, you can see the detailed information of the problem statements and also you can create your team and uh, register to each problem statement in this site. 
Uh, as Alpha mentioned, uh, from Japan side, Rising is hosting the problem statements. So Rising is a special ad hoc committee of the IEICE, the Institute of Electronics, Information and Communication Engineer, Engineers. The purpose of Rising is to introduce, discuss, and uh, gather information on research of intelligent communication technologies and uh, system with AI. So, this slide shows the uh, organizers of Japan Challenge, Nakao Sensei, Fuji Sensei, Iwata san, Otani san, Uchibana Sensei, uh, Tsukamoto Sensei, and me. Uh, most of them are uh, committee of rising, and uh, they are uh, making effort to manage Japan Challenge. Uh, please allow me to use this opportunity to offer my thanks. Okay, so let's begin the main part of the, this webinar. Uh, the first presenter is Professor Koichi Adachi. Uh, he's an associate professor of the University of Electoral Communications. He will present the problem statement number 16, location estimation using RSSI of wireless RAM. So, Adachi Sensei, could you please begin now? Okay, so this is the uh... Ex brief explanation about our pro problem statement number 16, location estimation using LSSI or Wellesland. Uh, I'm from, I'm Koichi Adachi from the University of Electrical Communication, Japan. And you can uh, access the website through this uh, URL or you can use just a scan this uh, QR code. So uh, this problem statement is organized by Rising as Komodo Sensei explained. So I just skip this. Page. So let me first explain about the background of this uh, problem statement. As you know that the demand for location information is becoming more important and popular due to the emerge of the several applications, such as like the map applications and the social network service, uh, SNS, uh, including like uh, Google Map, Instagram, Twitter, because whenever you go to some place, uh, you want to check where you want to go and how you can go there. And also when you upload, uh, for example, like some photo using the phone, uh, it is tagged with the location information. And another one, another application is like augmented reality, including like a Pokemon Go. Uh, on that one, in that application, some kind of artif uh, uh, augmented reality is on top of your reality. And also the another one is the virtual reality. So for this kind of applications, it's, it is necessary to have some location information. So one of the major uh, mainstream of the location localization for many years is the GPS global positioning systems. Uh, for example, like uh, Google map, they use the, the GPS and also the car navigation systems, they also use the GPS. Uh, for GPS, to localize the, the location, it is necessary to have more than four satellites in the, the space uh, for the accurate positioning. If the number of the satellites that can be seen from the receiver decreases, its accuracy significantly decreases and it's degrades, especially uh, if you are uh, between the like buildings and also you are in the inside of the buildings. You cannot use a GPS for localization. So recently, another way to have the localization has been attracting the attentions. Uh, that is RSSI aided localizations. The received RSSI stands for the received signal strength indicator. And this one shows that how long uh, the signal transmitted from a specific transmitter is received at each position. For example, like when you are using the mobile phone, uh, you can get the RSSI information uh, that is indicating the how strong the radio signal transmitted from the base station you are using. And there are two major, major approaches based on the RSSI for localization. The first one is RSSI map-based localization. And second one is a range-based localization. Both of them use the RSSI information. In analysis and map-based localization, first you need to construct some kind of a database that the map for the RSSI, same as a physical map when you are 
traveling, you, you need to use a map where you are and where you are going, so how you want to go. So this map in, uh, includes the analysis and information about, uh, about the analysis and information. For example, like where you are, how much LSSI, uh, how much LSSI strong strength is. Then based on that map, you can understand where you are. So whenever you want to have the lo uh, location information, first you measure the LSSI information and then compares the observed LSSI with a pre-stored radio map for localization. However, uh, for this kind of a map, uh, this is a map-based localization. We need to have the plyo map construction. So before you do the localization, firstly you need to construct the map, same as the, the map for the traveling. So it's uh, uh, it, it is quite accurate, but it has such kind of a difficulty. The second one is a range-based localization using the LSSI. For example, like a multilateralization utilizes LSSI of uh, multiple base stations or access points. Uh, for example, like on this left side figures, uh, this one, uh, left side figure, this one, use the TOA, the time of arrival. For example, like when you receive the LSSI from the multiple base stations, for example, like three base stations, the received signal LSSI indicates that how strength you are and Based on the, some kind of uh, the past loss model, you can estimate the distance between each transmitter to this receiver. And another one is the time difference of a live TDOA. However, to have this kind of a localization, you need to have the accurate channel model. So if the channel model is different from the one place to another place, you need to use another model. And if the model is different from the actual channel model, in that case, the, this uh, localization is not so accurate. So, and another one is that the multiple fading channel, it, due to that one, the channel changes quite rapidly, uh, more than the, uh, the location. So localization accuracy degrades due to multiple fading. Based on these backgrounds, this challenge aims to Firstly, verify if the artificial intelligence AI or machine learning ML aided localization using the LSSI can achieve a similar accuracy as the GPS based localization. And explore the possibility if the data oriented localization can replace the model based localization. So, uh, based on the, this LSSI information, we want to have the accurate localization it is comparable to the GPS-based localization. Uh, for this competition, we will provide uh, some data set for you to have the competition. The training data containing the following information will be provided to the participants, uh, participating teams. The first one is information about the AP access point. This information includes the access point information, the SSID, latitude, longitude, and height difference, and indoor, outdoor, and the reference information. And second information is information about the received data. So based on the one access point or base station, and there are the multi points, uh, there are the multi uh, information about the multi points. This information includes the sequential number and timestamp and the latitude, the longitude and SSID and the channel. Uh, this channel means that the frequency channel and that one of the, uh, the most important information is this LSSI DDM. So based on this data set, you are requested to train the developed algorithm by the training data set using this LSSI location by the GPS. And after that, we have the, some evaluation process. Uh, this is evaluation process. The first one is that uh, you need to develop a program and tune that AI or ML structure localization algorithm and the parameters using the training data and submit all the required materials and the localization results using the test data set to the administrative office uh, to us by 30th of September. And we will select the top ranking teams and the selected teams will perform localization based on the additional test data set 
the newly created data set during the Grand Challenge finale. Uh, this one, uh, we will provide a detail later in the, on the website. And evaluation will be done based on the criteria provided in the next slides. Uh, these are the evaluation criteria. The first one is just as uh, you need to perform. And evaluation criteria includes the average localization error and the maximum error and algorithm performance, including the co computational complexity and adaptivity to dynamic environment. And top three teams, sorry, this one may not be three, maybe a few teams are supposed to compete by using the, this data set provided just before the final competition. So uh, if you have any question or inquiry, please contact uh, Professor Fukumoto or Professor Nakao, or uh, you can check the website as I showed in the first page. Okay, so this is end of my talk. Uh, I would like to accept uh, some questions, comment from the audience. Okay, thank you, Adachi Sensei. So, if you have any question or comments, so please use the Q&A function or please uh, input the comment directly. And I think that we have one question from the participant. So yes. can you see the comment? Yeah. Why can not we use Li-Fi, uh, maybe that uh, visible light communication uh, as the most accurate LBS for L uh, IBS coverage? So this is a question from the participant. So can you? Okay, so Li-Fi, you mean the uh, yeah. visible light? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Time, yeah, okay, this time the competition is for outdoor. I think the, it's not just indoor. Li-Fi can be only used in indoor because you need the light. So this time the, we just use the Wi-Fi, not the Li-Fi. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for the answer. So I think that the, uh, okay, if you have any other question or comment, uh, please use the q and function. So we'd like to move to the uh, next presentation. So the next second presenter is Dr. Tomohiro Otani. He is an executive director of KDDR Research. Uh, he will present the problem statement number 15. Uh, network failure detection and uh, root cause analysis in 5GC by NFA-based test environment. So, Otani-san, could you please begin? Okay, thank you very much uh, for your introduction. And good morning, uh, good evening, uh, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. So, my name is uh, Tomo Otani uh, from KDDI Corporation and KDDI Research. I'm going to talk about network failure detection and uh, root cause analysis in 5GC by NFP based test environment. So this is the agenda of my presentation. Firstly, I will share uh, the background of, of this program statement. And then I will show you uh, our targeted network configuration. And then I will dive into uh, the data set part, types and generation principle. And finally, I will cover program statement one and two and submission uh, ways. So this is the background of uh, the problem statement. Nowadays, 5G is getting uh, popular and being operated uh, all over the world. And however, uh, if uh, the deployment is uh, gradually, uh, globally uh, deployed, uh, operation uh, consideration uh, will be uh, increased. So in that case, uh, we are thinking the uh, adoption of AI. Since if we look at uh, the operational end-to-end uh, -end life cycle from plan, deliver, deploy, operate, uh, there are many challenges, various user requirements, complex design deploy, uh, expert management skill, and uh, complicated recovery plan, complex resource allocation, and so forth. 
So we, we are thinking that AI support must is a must for this kind of end-to-end -end 5G operation, especially uh, from the point of operation. Uh, we, we would like to think about the apply of AI to, uh, to solve uh, those issues. So this is the background of uh, our problem statement. And lastly, uh, we uh, touched upon uh, the real networks of 5G, uh, especially uh, we assume the internet. Uh, uh, the directly attached uh, AS and non-directly attached multiple AS's. Uh, and the, we assume uh, various uh, network failure scenario and we gave a uh, data set uh, in, this, uh, in this environment. This year, we uh, shift uh, from the internet part to 5G core part. Since we could uh, collect uh, almost all the uh, effective data for uh, the problem uh, statement. So this year, we would like to focus on uh, 5G core part. And uh, we, I, some, some people have, have been already familiar with the uh, uh, problem statement, uh, but I uh, review again how, what's the, the principle of data collection for a uh, data set. Here you can see uh, operational environment along with uh, a test bed. All the operational environment has a kind of test bed for uh, verification, testing, uh, analyzing uh, the real environment. So, and now we are in, in the era of NFV, even uh, cloud native uh, function. And by taking advantage of NFV, we can easily uh, simulate the operational environment in NFB test bed. This is the uh, uh, idea for data collection principle. So we, we, we easily created the simulated uh, test bed and we intentionally added the effect to this test bed. NFB can easily uh, simulate the defect in networks and servers and uh, everywhere. So we can uh, data we can collect the data according to intended uh, defect. So we store uh, the collected data and properly pre-process. And uh, by using a learning part, we create a model and then evaluate uh, the test data. Once we create uh, the AI model, we deploy uh, the actual environment. But today we focus on the, this, uh, Left hand side part. The right hand side, uh, right hand side is uh, in, in near future. But in this uh, problem statement, we would like to focus on uh, left hand side. And this is the more detailed uh, data collection principle. We, add, as I mentioned, we added uh, intended failures in, in test bed, and we wait for a while the uh, stable statement, uh, stable state of networks, and then recover. And then again, we add in, uh, intended failure. We, uh, uh, we uh, continue uh, this operation uh, step by step, time by time. And it, one point uh, to be uh, clear, is that there are uh, transition state between these uh, applied scenario, like between failure and recovery or recovery and failures. So we eliminate uh, those parts and we collect only uh, very stable uh, data. The data uh, collection point is every uh, 10 seconds and these uh, 
failure and recovery uh, period is uh, 60 uh, seconds. So we, we collect only uh, three uh, points between failure and recovery, and recovery and failure like, like this. So we can uh, collect, we, we, we can only uh, utilize very stable uh, abnormal and normal data. So this is a, a second principle of data collections. And uh, we provide uh, two data sets for, uh, one is for learning and another is for evaluations. For learning data, all failures are uh, comprehensively invoked at all failure points and failure scenario. And, and as for uh, evaluation, failure scenario points are randomly and limited generated. So if you uh, scan the data set, for, data set files for learning and train uh, the data model, the trained uh, AI models. And once you get trained data model, you can move to evaluation phase by using uh, data set files for evaluations. And we, we uh, evaluate uh, your trained model uh, by using evaluation data. And th those are example of uh, data set. So you can see uh, those in, in radar. In summary uh, that, uh, of data set types, we have two categories. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, in terms of data, we provide virtual infrastructure, physical infrastructure, infrastructure, and network 5GC uh, data. And in addition to that, we also provide uh, label uh, data including uh, failure information. Since uh, this data is corresponding to that uh, failure and blah, blah, blah. So you can create uh, models by using uh, two data sets, those data sets. And let me uh, explain a problem one and two. In order to align real operation environment, we provide a data set in case of low and high volume of calls, assuming urban and rural environment. So participants are asked to consider the common trained model or separate trained model to estimate. For example, I, I, we provide urban data and rural data. So you can uh, separately create a model for urban or rural, or if you can do uh, common, uh, it, it, it's all right. So this is a problem one. And if we move to problem two, uh, we have, uh, co considering the actual environment, we may uh, collect very limited data. Uh, and so uh, assuming that case, uh, we provide the limited data, but this is uh, not, not urban or not uh, rural. This is the mixed uh, core data. So in, 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 that, in that area, uh, we would like to create a train model here. But, so there are many uh, techniques uh, to so solve uh, this uh, environment. For example, you may utilize the data argumentation, the data augmentation, or you may be able to use transfer learning or et cetera, what you uh, like. So you may add some trained model for create uh, this uh, trained model. So this is a problem uh, too. So uh, please uh, solve those two problem and uh, pro please uh, provide uh, the, your result uh, to ITU uh, uh, event page. So uh, in, in terms of uh, submission, uh, please uh, submit a PowerPoint file indicating the result and showing predicting uh, performance of your uh, created AI uh, machine learning models. If you have any question, uh, please uh, send the email message to uh, this uh, addresses. We are happy to uh, receive uh, your questions. So this is the end of our slide. So if you have any questions, uh,
Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Otani san. Thank you very much. You any... Yeah, thank you so much. So, we'd like to move on to the next part. So, next part is the expert talks. And the next presenter is Professor Akihiro Nakao. He's a professor of the University of Tokyo. And his talk is about the autonomous networking for beyond 5G. So, Nakao sensei, could you please begin now? Okay. Uh, thank you uh, for introduction. And thank you, thank you uh, all the speakers uh, to explain the problem statements. So now we switch gears to uh, give a presentation uh, from me and also uh, Professor Yamamoto after me. <clears throat> so my talk title is Autonomous Networking for Beyond 5G. And we're gonna talk a little bit about what's happening in Japan regarding the Beyond 5G uh, in the context of uh, autonomous networking. <clears throat> So first, uh, briefly uh, introduce myself. Uh, so I moved to uh, School of Engineering this year. So if uh, you listened to my talk last year, uh, I, I, my uh, department uh, affiliation is uh, uh, different from uh, last year. But now <clears throat> I became a chairman of the International Committee of Beyond 5G Promotion Consortium. So uh, I'd like to briefly uh, introduce uh, what it is about and also how it is relate, how it's related to autonomous networking. So Beyond 5G a Promotion Consortium was established uh, <clears throat> last year. Uh, first, in June 2020, the strategic proposal for a 6G R&D has been uh, summarized uh, by the Beyond 5G strategic board <clears throat> held by the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communication, uh, we call it MIC. And in December uh, 18th, the Beyond 5G Promotion Consortium uh, has been established uh, in Japan. And uh, <clears throat> under a general meeting, we have two committees. Uh, the first one is pl uh, Planning and a Strategy Committee, and the second one is International Committee. And we are, we are trying to identify the R&D directions uh, of um, uh, developing the next generation cyber infrastructure, we are calling it Beyond 5G. Um, the, in the other region on Earth, uh, it's called you know, 6G, but uh, we intentionally call it Beyond 5G because uh, we like to think about you know, the farther ahead, uh, not just 6G, but the Beyond 5G is the right term to use for us. <clears throat> and in international committee, uh, we are trying to uh, collaborate and cooperate uh, with the other countries. So ITU, uh, this type of event is perfect for uh, um, letting people know what's going on in Japan and we'd like to uh, get a feedback on, for example, uh, like the talks and also problem statements uh, that we are presented today. <clears throat> so here is the seven directions that uh, our strategy committee have identified the key features for Beyond 5G. So there are seven boxes uh, shown on the screen and uh, the three uh, boxes at the top. Um, this is ultra fast large capacity, ultra low latency and ultra numerous connectivity. So these are the further upgrade of 5G features. And the bottom four boxes, the orange boxes, ultra low power consumption and ultra security and resilience and autonomy and scalability. So these are the, uh, the directions that, that are expected to add new features and new values uh, contributing to uh, the generation of a sustainable and uh, uh, future society. <clears throat> and uh, let's look at this autonomy part. So uh, this is one of the seven directions and we think that this is a very important uh, direction of R&D. So we like to integrate AI and machine learning. This is the future. This is the part of uh, the Beyond 5G uh, next generation cyber infrastructure. So one of them is it's about uh, autonomous coordination among devices without minor intervention because uh, minor intervention, uh, it's costly. And we like to optimize, uh, for example, as uh, Otanisan uh, 
I explained the problem statement uh, just now. So we'd like to uh, be able to uh, detect and predict the network failure and the network uh, uh, infrastructure behavior uh, in advance using machine learning. So this is the exactly the same slide that uh, <clears throat> these two, the couple of slides, uh, this one and this one. You know, I stole uh, these uh, slides from Otanisan, but uh, he's uh, running a national project uh, over the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communication. So KDD is a lead uh, uh, player in NICT, NEC, and Hitachi are cooperating. So we think that uh, the plan, deliver, deploy, operate. So these are the, uh, the main four components of operating networks. But we think that in future, uh, these uh, should be supported by AI functions. So AI empowered energy and 5G operation uh, is necessary. And uh, instead of uh, waiting for the next uh, generation beyond 5G, we started working on this. And uh, I'm uh, closely <coughs> uh, related to uh, this uh, project because um, uh, Otani-san and I uh, always discussing you know, how we should uh, 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 encourage uh, this uh, type of R&D uh, in Japan. In University of Tokyo, uh, we established the FSI Future Society Initiative. So this is uh, side by side uh, with the ministry's uh, movement towards the next generation cyber infrastructure. I'm chairing this uh, next generation cyber infrastructure initiative projects uh, at the University of Tokyo. If you go to the top page of University of Tokyo, so this page introduces several projects. So right now, <clears throat> 26 big uh, projects uh, led by several professors, um, various professors uh, shown, introduced uh, in this page. So I can go into the detail, but uh, some of them are run by me. And uh, one of them is, is about the uh, research and the development of super intelligent computing architecture. <clears throat> So this is uh, one of the national projects, the big one, uh, but KDDI is now uh, trying to uh, develop a high performance and low power consumption computing architecture. And University of Tokyo is uh, trying to run a super intelligent network on top of that so that we can use AI to reduce the power consumption. And how we uh, interact by these two components together uh, is a big thing of uh, an, an objective of this uh, project. <clears throat> and on the other hand, um, uh, this uh, focus group uh, is formed at the ATU, the focus group of uh, autonomous uh, networks, FGN. Uh, so this is run by uh, RAKTEN. Uh, this is led by RAKTEN people. And uh, in Japan, we have ad hoc uh, meeting uh, at TTC. So uh, several, uh, telecommunication players and also university academic partners are participating in this focus group. For example, Kumat Sensei and also uh, Professor Pin Pindu are uh, part of uh, this group. So, and also NICT published the white paper for Beyond 5G. And of course, machine learning and AI are part of it. But uh, today I like to, um, so if you are interested uh, in this uh, white paper, you can go to uh, this uh, URL and uh, take a look at uh, uh, the detail of uh, what's uh, NICT. This is a national lab affiliated with MIC um, is uh, titled in that. So today I'd like to introduce uh, local 6G uh, written, noted in this uh, white paper. So I contributed this idea and I'd like to talk about autonomous networking in the context of a local 6G. <clears throat> so what is, 6G, what, what is a local 6G? <clears throat> so we like to um, promote the idea of a democratization of telecommunication. And I gave a presentation, the keynote presentation at Kaleidoscope uh, 2020 last year. And there I uh, introduced the idea of a democratizing 5G democratizing the beyond 5G uh, telecommunication. So uh, democratization uh, means the action of making something accessible to everyone. 
make a radio frequency license available to everyone. For example, in Japan, uh, local 5G regulation is instated. So um, non-teleco people can apply for the license ban so that they, they can uh, use the 5G, uh, 5G telecommunication using a white space not allocated for uh, uh, telecom operators. So the reason why this uh, idea is important is, is that <clears throat> we increase the chance of uh, innovations. You know, we don't uh, leave um, the innovation uh, to the hand of uh, uh, telecommunication or network vendors, but all the people involved uh, in, for example, a private band of uh, 5G. So in Japan, it's called a local 5G, uh, but they, they can all uh, uh, get involved in the development of uh, next generation uh, telecommunication. So this is pretty uh, important idea. Uh, uh, and, and also it's, it's lucky that we, we feel lucky that uh, Japan is, has uh, already uh, made this uh, regulation uh, for us. So usually the 5G can be evolved into 6G uh, by a regular evolution path, like standardization. And the telecom operator and the network vendors can lead this uh, path. But at the same time, if you have a private networks, <clears throat> uh, for example, in Japan, it's called a local 5G, but uh, various innovation uh, can be uh, driven by uh, customization in uh, local regions. And it can evolve into local 6G and we can collect the common features and consolidate, consolidate the ideas into a 6G. So we can follow these two paths at the same time, a regular evolution path and private networks innovations. So there you can try many interesting ideas. And for example, AI machine learning integration, if uh, it's, it takes time and it's, uh, you know, difficult to uh, get an agreement from the telecom operators. Uh, we can go ahead and use the private networks and apply the AI and the machine learning integration. So not just AI machine learning integration, uh, we can integrate all kinds of customizations. Uh, and one of them <coughs> is uh, tried out uh, in the software base station that we are developing. So this is called local fiber in the box cost uh, effective uh, PC based software base station of uh, 5G. It has um, even uh, uh, 5G core system integrated in one PC. <clears throat> I'm, uh, we are working with the European vendor of a software base station and we customize that because uh, <clears throat> uh, in local 5G, we see that uh, the opportunities of uh, customization tailored for a local province. So last year we used uh, this um, equipment to uh, um, to solve the uh, local uh, government's problem and to accelerate uh, uh, the local uh, region's uh, revitalization. But uh, this year we tried uh, some different things and we uh, enhance the upload uh, uplink uh, optimization. And instead of, uh, so the teleco always does the download optimization, but uh, because the local problems, we uh, often try to use the upload link uh, more than a download link. So we optimize the uplink using a softwareized base station. <clears throat> so, the key idea uh, is, is that develop a new uh, TDD pattern, um, not interfering with the carrier uh, pattern. So this is the TDD time slots. And the carrier patterns are uh, like this. So D stands for the download slot and the U stands for an uplink slot and the S is a simple slot. So as you can see, carriers is optimizing um, their base station uh, downlink or for downlink. So you see that uh, lots of downlink uh, slots, but uh, we can develop a new patterns uh, for local 5G. Uh, we can increase the number of uh, uh, uplink slots, but in a way that uh, are not interfering with the carrier presence because we don't want to interfere with the carrier's uh, business. 
usually carries a radio frequency band and uh, local 5G bands side by side. So technically, um, it should be isolated. They, they should be isolated from each other. But sometimes, if you are <coughs> running the um, the, the radio uh, transmission, uh, so then you have to be careful uh, not to interfere with this someone else's uh, uh, business. So uh, when the carrier is doing uh, downlink, uh, uh, we can do uplink. But uh, if a carrier is doing uplink, so then we're not allowed to do uplink at, at downlink because uh, that may uh, affect the um, uh, lots of UEs and interference. So we, um, because uh, <clears throat> our uh, base station is soft uh, we can easily customize uh, this one. Uh, and we develop uh, new patterns. And uh, in short, uh, we can achieve the very much uh, uh, high bandwidth uh, for uh, uplink. So this is the one uh, customization that we can do. So if we develop, once we develop this type of uplink optimization, uh, we can use the uh, AI-based application-based slicing. And we are using that uh, for our living lab test bed uh, consisting of this uh, software base station. So what democratization means to researchers are the following. So we can do network slicing of uh, application basis uh, network softwareization, uh, edge computing, autonomous management using AI and ML, and local regions empowered by uh, IoT or AI. So we can um, uh, program our uh, base station uh, so that we can integrate uh, AI and ML uh, uh, capability uh, in it easily. So for uh, this uh, development, uh, we are running another uh, national project with Apresia and uh, Fujitsu, IIJ, and U Tokyo. I don't want to uh, go into the detail because uh, there's a time constraint, but uh, this is an open source 5G core project. And once we can uh, uh, softwareize G0B and the 5G core, so then uh, we can do uh, application basis, uh, per application basis network slicing. So there are several applications uh, running uh, using the same uh, infrastructure, EMBB, ULLC, and MMTC. But if uh, we can do a per application basis uh, slicing, so then we can uh, do a RAN slicing, core slicing, transport slicing up to a cloud. So, and because everything is authorized, we can embed a network functions. <clears throat> and some applications <clears throat> like uh, uh, video surveillance uh, may want to do a uplink, uh, you know, may, may want to use more uplink bandwidth than downlink. So if we can combine the customization that we did for the gene of B and this uh, network slicing, uh, we, we should be able to um, optimize the usage of uh, uh, this uh, 5G or beyond 5G uh, and, and the infrastructure. But here is um, our uh, challenge. So how can we classify uh, these applications, uh, application by application? So there we can introduce the AI and uh, ML. So we can tag the application traffic and generate the super uh, Python data and then train the system so that we can learn the traffic pattern and break down the total traffic into application traffic. So here, it's, so the different color uh, means the different applications and uh, we should be able to differentiate the uh, application, uh, sorry, the traffic by applications. Okay, so we can use this idea for a satellite communication because a satellite communication link is limited. So if uh, we like to uh, classify the traffic and we can apply this AI technique, a machine learning technique to classify the application uh, by applications so that uh, you can send the most important uh, 
application traffic over to the satellite communication link. Also, we can apply the same idea uh, to a local 5G and the satellite communication. This is a joint work uh, between uh, EU and Japan. And we are trying out this idea uh, using the software customized the base stations. Another application use case is the, the um, connected car applications, because uh, we have a bunch of uh, own vehicle applications and we would like to uh, <clears throat> classify applications traffic at the G node B and also uh, 5G core and send it to that. So we have seen lots of applications of um, AI machine learning embedded in the 5G network. Uh, and we are trying to do uh, develop uh, this uh, system, machine learning embedded in the uh, UPF over 5G uh, core and also what uh, round slicing at the genome B. So we um, we do we ran an application uh, identification engine by uh, using the machine learning at the UPF of 5 gc and try to classify the uh, the traffic uh, application uh, basis. So how we do it um, is um, so today I'm not going to explain that because I covered this topic. Uh, in last year's webinars uh, in detail. So we use a random forest, uh, deep learning, but basically we use a supervised learning, you know, taking a look, look at the uh, uh, traffic uh, pattern, traffic characteristics, and then we um, try to identify the application uh, types uh, by looking at the characteristics of the traffic. So I think uh, there is a recorded uh, video of webinar uh, from last year. So if you are interested, uh, you can take a look at that. So in summary, <clears throat> in uh, today's talk, uh, we show that the democratization is a pretty neat idea uh, and opening a door uh, to the innovation towards the uh, 6G. So we think that, uh, that besides the regular evolution path, this um, private 5G to private 6G, in Japan, local 5G to local 6G and then to uh, uh, public uh, 6G. So we have two uh, paths side by side towards the innovations. And uh, we, academia, uh, should play an important role here uh, together with the telecos and also uh, network vendors. And finally, the integration of AI machine learning and networking is a perfect research agenda to pursue in this uh, democratized their communications. So this is the end of my talk. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, uh, you can ask uh, now. I uh, welcome all the questions. And Nakao Sensei, thank you for your presentation covering uh, the very wide range of the uh, latest trend of the AI, machine learning, and 5G. Thank you so much. The last presenter is Professor Koji Yamamoto. He is an associate professor of Kyoto University. The title of his talk is Machine Learning for Wireless Land. <laughs> so, Yamamoto Sensei, can you be in now? Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Fukumoto Sensei, for inviting me and introducing me. Uh, hi, everyone. And uh, today I'm going to talk on machine learning for wireless lands. Uh, this talk is a short and updated version of tutorials, including IEEE ICC. Uh, in this lecture talk, uh, I'm going to briefly overview both deep learning and deep reinforcement learning by explaining our applications to microwave and the millimeter wave wireless lands. In this first part, as an interesting example of deep learning, I'm going to briefly overview of this work, uh, deep learning for millimeter wave wireless lands. This work is mainly done by my collaborator, Professor Nishio at Tokyo Institute of Technology and Dr. Nishio, uh, Dr. Koda at the University of Old. Uh, in this work, we tackled human body blockage problem in millimeter wave communications. 
as you may know, uh, millimeter wave frequency bands are utilized both for 5G and wireless lands and both for uh, beyond 5G and 6G. And it enables beyond the gigabps communications owing to their wide bandwidth. On the other hand, millimeter wave communications are suffered from strong attenuations uh, due to human blockage. Here, there is a millimeter wave communications between this access point and client. And uh, because the frequency of millimeter wave is high, millimeter wave communications has similar properties to visible light. Thus, as uh, it's the person, this person makes a shadow for this signal. And the received power and the throughput uh, will be significantly degraded during the blockage. Uh, what you see here shows the uh, received throughput and the during the blockage, uh, received uh, throughput will be, have been uh, significantly degraded. To tackle this uh, human body blockage program, we made a novel received power prediction framework. An important idea here is to use deep learning and the camera images. And using these images, uh, we train the deep neural networks and the trained neural network output the future received power. We made a test fit and uh, uh, I'll show you a movie version. And uh, what you see here shows the uh, camera images and this uh, blue curve, blue curve represents the uh, real received uh, signal, uh, received power. And uh, this red curve represents the uh, uh, estimated uh, received power. Uh, and the uh, important point here is the, this uh, blue sequence uh, was uh, uh, measured just now. Uh, this is a uh, uh, present time, uh, but uh, now the neural network output outputs the uh, estimated power that will be received after 0 0.5 seconds. Uh, so you can see uh, this kind of uh, neural network can uh, relatively uh, accurate uh, predicted received power. So can you imagine how we made it? So let me explain how to enable this kind of uh, prediction with deep learning. So here we treat this prediction program from camera images to future received power as a regression program. Uh, I like to explain this regression problem by using the analogy with uh, linear regression from single input to single output. This is very simple regression problem. In the linear regression, uh, the relation between the input and output uh, is expressed as a linear function. Here, I like to point out that the linear function can be expressed by a, single, a simple perceptron uh, that is the simplest neural network. And I'm going to explain it in the following slide. In contrast, in the original prediction framework, uh, we utilize the rela uh, relation uh, between the camera images and this future received power by using this neural network, relatively complicated neural network. Then I like to uh, explain this uh, simple perceptron. A simple perceptron generally expressed as this graph represents this function. And that is uh, this neural network first takes the weighted sum of input x, that is wx, and applies activation function phi and returns it as an output y. Then we consider a simpler, more simple neural network that is a simple perceptron with single output. That is, uh, a bias, this is a bias term B and assuming linear activation function, then the graph, this graph represents the linear function uh, Wx plus B. What you see here is a PyTorch code 
PyTorch is a my, uh, machine learning framework, as, as you may know. And uh, this neural network uh, represents this very simple uh, linear function. Uh, this code uh, means this uh, in this part, uh, there is a single input and a single output. And the activ activation function is linear. So let's return to the pred uh, original prediction program. So here we write to find the function F1 uh, from images to the future received power. In contrast, in the linear regression, we write to find the function F2 uh, using level data set. And in other words, we write to find W, uh, w and V by using level data set. Here's an example of data set. We use a, a data set following 2x plus 3 plus noise. So uh, now I'm going to uh, share with you some uh, very simple example. And here uh, I will show you, if you are interested, you can uh, send the... Oh, in chat, uh, in the chat screen, I will send you a, a link to this uh, code. In this example, I intentionally used the machine learning framework for linear regression, just a linear regression. If, and important uh, here, I will just, uh, okay, so, here I uh, importing libraries, just <laughs> importing libraries and generating data set. And this is a data set as you show uh, before. And uh, we define neural network, but this neural network represents a linear function and uh, setting a uh, stochastic gradient descent and the mean square error loss function and training. Then after training, uh, we successfully train. <laughs> of course, this is, this is just a very simple uh, machine learning uh, linear regression. Then the neural network linear function uh, successfully uh, uh, estimate the linear function uh, expressing 2x plus three. So uh, we can easily uh, check the weight. Uh, weight W is the around two and bias B around three. So, uh, and also uh, up to now we use a scalar as an input in contrast if we write to increase the order of inputs, uh, in this case, uh, two inputs, we assume two inputs, but you can, uh, here you can increase the order or increase the degree of input as a matrix or image, deep neural networks. Uh, deep neural networks is a solution. And that is, we increase the number of layers and increase the number of neurons in each layer. As a result, the parameters in neural network increases and it increases the degree of freedom for regression. That is the neural network can approximate more complex function. This PyTorch code uh, express this neural network. So that is, uh, uh, the, I added two layers and utilize not a linear function, let do as an activation function. The important point here is the neural network still represent uh, one function uh, with input X, but single output. So the training approach, uh, so the, uh, this kind of training approach is same as in the linear regression. So let's return to the original program. The question here is uh, what kind of reliable data set we should prepare? 
in our test bed uh, at each time we took an image and received power uh, by using this kind of data set how can we tra train the neural network uh, that is function f1 this function f1 so i like to remind you that the function f1 is a relation between the images to the future received power so can you imagine how we made it So uh, they are measured data, but we need a full process from this measured data to the level data set for training the neural network. For inputs, we take a past images, these past images, and for output, we take future received power. In other words, we ignore uh, past uh, received power and uh, present uh, our future uh, images. So we use this kind of uh, level data set and we train the neural network. Uh, after that, the trained neural network successfully predicted the future received power only from past images. In other words, we can say the past image contains the information on the velocity of a human body uh and they successfully uh, estimate the tra uh, timing when the body blocks the communications so i will explain one application of this kind of futurist uh, power prediction in the following part okay then i'd like to move on to the second part the enforcement running uh, in this part, I will introduce uh, one some of our recent results. And the first work is done by mainly by, uh, done by my former PhD student, Dr. Kamiya. I start with a very simple problem. Consider this toy model with five access points and two frequency channels. So here we omit stations uh, because access point one and two uh, adjacent to uh, adjacent with each other, uh, one of them can be transmit uh, can transmit at a given time. So here we would like to maximize the aggregated throughput of these five access points by optimally assigning two channels to these access points. The solution is simple, as you can see here, alternate channel allocation. So here the color represents the uh, channel index. So red channel and blue channel. And generally speaking, this type of optimization is a combinatorial optimization program and it is, uh, it is known to be an NP hat. But let's move on to a little bit different problem compared to this one. So here we like to find the shortest sequence from the some initial state to optimal states. Uh, here, the, these two optimal states are equivalent. Also here we assume that uh, at each time step, only one access point can uh, change their channel. In addition, the slope can be uh, observed only after channel allocation. So how can we solve this kind of problem? Uh, what you see here shows example sequences from this initial state to the optimal states from uh, this one to this one in the first sequence access point two and the access point four change their channels and it takes two time steps to achieve the final allocation in contrast in the second uh, sequence Access point three, then one, and then five change their channels, and it takes three time steps. Of course, there are many other possibilities with uh, more than uh, more time steps, but in this case, the first sequence is desirable. As you can see in this toy model, we like to acquire the knowledge of the channel allocation sequence. So, how can we do that? So let me get straight to the point. The approach framework is deep reinforcement run. Uh, deep, reinforce, uh, deep reinforcement running 
with blank convolution uh, is a approach for this kind of uh, problem. And this framework contains three factors, reinforcement learning, deep learning, and graph convolution. So I'm going to start with the reinforcement learning. And here we utilize Q learning as an important uh, example. Uh, Q learning is a very classic, but important. As a simple application of reinforcement learning, we consider tic-tac-toe game. So here we assume that we are second player node. And this is an example sequence from here to here. The first player take at, uh, and second player, first player, second player, blah, 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 blah. And by using the term terminology in reinforcement learning, the second player uh, observes the first, uh, this first state and takes action, then observes the next state. Also, the player uh, receives the reward that is win or loss. The problem here is the machine or agent does not know the rule of the tic-tac-toe game, and only based on the observed sequence, uh, this observed sequence, state action reverse state as the agents should determine the appropriate action after training. The well-known basic approach is Q-learning and the most basic but important reinforcement learning. So uh, I start with classic tabular Q-learning. To conduct Q-learning, we need to prepare a Q-table for all states, all states, and all actions, this alphabet represents the position of this uh, board. Here, uh, the action should be chosen from nine cells uh, on the board. And the uh, state means the uh, realization of the board. And the value of each cell uh, represents the expected reward for associated action. At this state, at this state, uh, the second player should put at G here. Uh, so the value of cell G uh, should be high. Because the machine does not, uh, does not know the value in advance, we need to train this table only by using the observed sequence. Uh, before explaining the detail of algorithm of Q learning, I'm going to show you an example as, uh, by using the uh, Google Colab. So this is also a uh, I will share with you by using the chat. This one and. Uh, uh, I like to find the, uh, okay, this one. Here, uh, okay. Uh, so uh, what you see here shows the uh, 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 tic-tac-toe game q running and uh, Important, right? Importing libraries and defining uh, tic tac toe game. <laughs> very very uh, complicated. But uh, here, uh, you can see uh, what you see here shows the uh, value of Q table for uh, this uh, situation. So the value of this uh, part, this cell, should be high. And uh, what you see here shows the uh, uh, updated pattern of a Q table. So this uh, cell should be high value. And uh, after efficient number of uh, learning, uh, does not uh, sufficiently com uh, converse. So iteration or uh, Maybe this, this cell, the value of this cell will be increased after the number of uh, iterations. And uh, after that, uh, this 
kind of Q, uh, this uh, Q learning have been uh, converged to uh, optimal value. This is a very uh, basics uh, of Q learning. So, but uh, uh, problem here is the uh, very large number of uh, memories uh, we require. And in tic-tac-toe game, uh, the number of action is num uh, number of cells, and uh, that is nine. And because, and also because each cell uh, can have three uh, states, that is rank, note, or across, uh, that's the number of states is the ninth power of three. So even in this very simple problem, the number of elements in Q table is uh, very large. So let me go back to the channel allocation program. So uh, in this uh, program, uh, here we assume the agent can agent will be centralized controller and state will be channels and the contention graph of access points. So connectivity of access point. And action will be channel selection of one access point and reward uh, is related to uh, throughput. Uh, so I like to check the uh, size of Q table. Uh, in this case, if the number of access point is 10 and the number of channels is three, the, we, the size of state is very large. So we can't apply, we would like to, we, we don't like to apply uh, Tabla Q run for this kind of problem. Uh, to the solution for this kind of a problem is a uh, function but appro approximation, and uh, which is a technique for supervised learning. And uh, this is a uh, Tabla Q learning, and uh, I like to omit a uh, uh, detail, but uh, uh, we uh, apply function approximation for a uh, tab uh, tab uh, table for Q function. Uh, for this parameterized uh, function, if we utilize deep neural networks, uh, which I already uh, discussed in uh, part one, uh, we can say this, uh, this is a deep, deep, re uh, deep reinforcement run. So uh, the, uh, I like to explain the uh, detail, but uh, I omit the detail for the, because the time is uh, not enough. But uh, I uh, make this kind of uh, neural network and train uh, by using the uh, deep reinforcement running. And we can achieve the uh, very uh, good performance uh, are, uh, along with the uh, episode uh, time. So according to the uh, learning, uh, we can successfully uh, acquires the knowledge of this kind of channel allocation. So, uh, so I like to conclude in my talk. In the first part, I will have explained the deep neural networks and uh, this is uh, just a function and we train the neural network by using the camera images and the future received power. In the uh, second part, I explain the reinforcement running by uh, by using the exp uh, example of channel allocation. So uh, that's all for of my uh, presentation. First, for your at uh, attentions. Thank you, Yamamoto Sensei. So, do you have any question, comment? Okay, uh, now I have some comments in the Q and A page. Can you see the question? Yeah, <laughs> I can. Uh, now I, I will check. <laughs> but there are many, many. So, questions. Now we have three questions. Mm -hmm. How do you handle the impact of the deep uh, RL agent processing time in the overall performance of these approaches? 
I'm facing some difficulties in my work where the traditional approach is uh, uh, faster than the deep RL ones. Okay, now I check. Uh, I find. I found. Uh, how do you handle the impact of it? Uh huh. Mm, mm. Yeah, is there a uh, first uh, question? Mm. Mm. Uh, uh, as you uh, as your uh, question, the deep reinforcement learning takes very uh, large, uh, uh, very uh, the, the uh, algorithm of deep reinforcement learning is time consuming, and as you may as you mentioned, and but uh, uh, this kind of uh, reinforcement learning uh, can be done uh, in uh, compared to. Uh, uh independent of uh, real uh, channel allocation so uh, we uh, can conduct uh, such kind of uh, pre uh, learning uh, independent of the real uh, allocation so uh, we we should uh, conduct such kind of learning offline that is one uh, this is my uh, answer and the second question uh, I'd like to check. So for the first application, would you consider using recurrent neural network to utilize sequential information instead of inputting, inputting multiple images for different mm -hmm. times? Uh -huh. So uh, in the first uh, example, I have, uh, we utilized LSTM uh, based uh, neural networks. So uh, uh, here we utilize LSTM. And LSTM is a, a kind of uh, recurrent neural networks. And uh, you, um, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so because uh, we utilize a series of time series of uh, images, just we utilize uh, uh, LSTM. LSTM can be handled a time series of uh, images. Thus, we utilize LSTM, but uh, uh, this is a kind of uh, uh, recurrent neural network. Thank you for your uh, question. And uh, yeah. third question here. Yeah, third question about the sharing the materials and the slides. So already answered. So we have all we also have some similar questions, but uh, I have already answered. We will provide the presentation slides on the event page later. Thank you. And I think that uh, uh, yeah, all questions answered. So do you have any question or comment to Yamamoto Sensei? Oh, another question is coming. <laughs> this is, I guess, this is just a comment. I, I think uh, Yamamoto Sensei, the question is whether the hmm? deep reinforcement learning part uh, code is available or not. That is the question. Uh, mm -hmm. The code for the deep reinforcement learning is it available? A code? Uh, I didn't use. Uh, 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 I didn't uh, uh, use the ah. I understand. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I share the code. Yes. Uh, I wouldn't share this kind of code for uh, deep reinforcement learning of channel allocation. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Do you have any other question? Okay. If not, so we have another question to comment to uh, Nakao Sensei and Otani san. So I'd like to move on to uh, this question and answer session. So uh, the first, so we have a question for uh, Otani san. So how are the submissions evaluated? So Otani san, could you please answer to the question? How are the submissions evaluated? Uh, 
Hi. Um, I, I guess we are uh, using uh, exactly the same process as last year. And uh, this, this year, I guess, uh, I, if I remember correctly, uh, last year, the submission was to the ITU, the ITU website. Uh, IT, I, I, ITU website has uh, the location uh, where uh, each uh, problem statement uh, is assigned. So I, ha I have to <laughs> double check with the ITU uh, people uh, at, at this time, uh, please submit to ITUT website. otani uh, sorry. sorry. Sorry, the question is uh, how how do you evaluate? So not, not how do you submit, but how do you evaluate? Uh, I evaluate. Uh, yeah. Firstly, uh, um, we will judge, uh, uh, we, we, we will review uh, internally and, uh, and also a rising community, uh, community uh, will review uh, the contents. And, uh, and also we will have a, a um, qualify those uh, uh, contributor in, in, in uh, I guess maybe three, last year, I guess uh, five, five team. Uh, if uh, we select uh, at most five team, qualified and then uh, we will ha host a uh, uh, small uh, small conference a small workshop to present uh, their qualified result and then uh, we will uh, review the presentation and and evaluate uh, people uh, teams thank you Yes, thank you so much, Otani san. You are, thank you for your answer. And uh, uh, we also have another two questions, uh, two questions for Nakao Sensei. So first question is the democratization of telecom is very interesting. Could you in the Q&A session explain a few details like the cost of such license and the process to obtain it? So Nakao Sensei, could you please answer to this question? Okay. Uh, thank you for your question. So first, uh, you know, I can explain uh, regulation. I'm sharing the slides. So, <clears throat> so we have um, sub uh, six, uh, 4.5 gigahertz band and also 28 gigahertz band. And for uh, 28, uh, we have uh, 100 megahertz. And uh, also uh, this area is under discussion. And also from 4.6 gigahertz to 4.9 gigahertz, we have opening for, we can apply for a license. And a cost for um, this, so I just uh, check with the uh, uh, ministry's page and of course, so there are two kinds of cost. The one is uh, utilizing a radio frequency. Um, and by the way, this is free of charge for academia. So we are not, um, we, we don't have to pay for it. But uh, usually the commercial entity uh, need to pay for each local 5G base station depending on uh, which uh, frequency band sub six or 28 gigahertz millimeter wave. But it's pretty cheap uh, per base station. It's about 55 US dollars, uh, 24 US dollars uh, for millimeter, millimeter wave base station. And you see, you know, uh, so we have to, so this is uh, per UE uh 3.5 uh, us dollars so this is for using a radio frequency so uh um <clears throat> it's just a, like a telco telco is paying for uh, the radio frequency allocation but for local it's 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 very cheap and a cost for license application so this is not uh this depends on the wattage power and also 
you do it uh, online or uh, offline license application. So depending on that, uh, we have different uh, costs, but uh, for a local 5G base station, uh, if the power is, uh, is large, so then 25 to 35 US dollars per each, and 15 to 20 US dollars for uh, uh, below uh, one wattage. And for UE, <coughs> 70 to 100 US dollars per UE. So you think that uh, this is much, much, uh, much more expensive for UE than uh, for a base station. But this is uh, what we got from uh, MIC. But uh, also it's according to a telex certified or not. So uh, if uh, your equipment is under, cert under certification of telex, uh, telex is in a certification agency in Japan. So uh, well, it's, uh, it's much cheaper, but uh, you, you have to pay extra if it is not certified. And for, uh, <clears throat> so this is the uh, uh, cost part. And for, in order to ap apply for the license, uh, we need to uh, go through some paperwork. And uh, so it's, it's depend it depends on the way you live and you have to go to the local uh, ministry agency to uh, submit uh, the license application. And also uh, you need to pay uh, individually. So I think uh, Korea is uh, uh, trying to do a local 5G now and other countries like uh, Germany, uh, it's much uh, higher cost for application I heard, but I don't know exactly how much, but in Japan it's like this. So there's a conversion rate, uh, rate that I need to adjust, but it's, it's about, you know, uh, it's not as, ex not as expensive as you may expect. So this is the answer, <coughs> answer to, yeah. uh, to the first question. Okay, thank you, Nakao-sensei. So, and uh, we, I have another question for Nakao-sensei. Uh, the question is, what are the use cases for local 6D? FGN studied various use cases for AN. Okay, uh, for focus group uh, has a working group of my use case. So I think, uh, so we have to keep in mind that uh, local 6G is highly customizable. And uh, so the local 5G is for targeted for, for uh, uh, solving, resolving the local problem, lo local region problem. So maybe, um, so there is a website uh, called uh, go5g.go.jp. Uh, and uh, so the English page doesn't have much information, which is typical in, uh, in Japan. But if you go to a uh, Japanese page, we have a lot of uh, local 5G experiment and you can download <coughs> the report. Uh, if you read it, the, uh, read, the, read the Japanese article, so it's helpful, but uh, I think someday it will get uh, translated. Uh, but you have lots of local 5G experiment reports here. So you can uh, take a look and uh, try to learn what's the uh, cost what kind of customization that we, we want to do. One uh, common customization is the uplink optimization. And also there is a need for a local uh, application traffic identification and a classification. So I think uh, this is the first um, uh, use case that is coming uh, you know, uh, out of uh, this local 6G uh, and another Thing. So I gave a kind of list of things like edge computing and because so for telecos 5G network, uh, we, have to, we have to be able to use um, edge cloud uh, infrastructure, but for local 5G, uh, we can, or maybe local 6G in future. So this is the equipment you have and for data network, you can put your own box for uh, uh, edge computing. So we can achieve very, very low, uh, ultra low latency application here. And there you can do all kinds of AN, the autonomous networking functions or machine learning, uh, traffic analysis. So 
uh, we have uh, lots of opportunities here. And one of the things that we are looking into uh, is uh, not autonomous management using AI and ML. We can integrate how the in integrate the network functions, how we uh, operate the network equipment autonomously. So that kind of idea uh, may come from this local 6G uh, environment. So, well, I can't answer all of them because uh, this is a story uh, in future, but we expect to see lots of applications coming from uh, democratized uh, local 6G environment. So I think this regulation of local 5G is very, very uh, viable and uh, promising. Thank you, Nakao Sensei. So I think, uh, sorry, I have uh, the last question for Yamamoto Sensei. So, Yamamoto Sensei, okay. So, in part one, what is the role played by the position of the camera? So, it's, it's just a technical question. Uh, <laughs> role, of, <laughs> role played by the uh, position of the camera. Yeah. Aha. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, the position of the camera is uh, somewhat important, but uh, uh, we check some uh, uh, position. And uh, if you, uh, uh, the, uh, mm, the position is uh, somewhat important. And, uh, but uh, important point here is the image should contain the information on when the uh, pedestrian uh, blocks the channel, uh, the communication channel. So if the uh, the camera images can contain such kind of information, uh, the uh, position of a camera camera uh, can be uh, so we can uh, use uh, other position of cameras. That is an important point here. Okay, and another question Thank is you. about the impact too. Uh, can we use deep uh, reinforcement learning to scale this solution to large number of base stations? Mm -hmm. mm. uh, I'm not so sure about the, uh, this kind of question, and uh, we try to uh, we try to find the uh, uh, the uh, framework to framework or approach to uh, utilize such kind of uh, deep neural net, a uh, deep reinforcement learning to acquire the uh, channel allocation. So if we uh, use, uh, so there are some uh, reports uh, that uh, says deep reinforcement learning will increase the performance of uh, radio networks, but we have checked uh, uh, and very, in this uh, very simple uh, performance here, uh, we utilize uh, uh, CNN, uh, convolutional neural networks, uh, very uh, 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 initial uh, study for uh, deep, rain, uh, deep reinforcement learning. But uh, just a very simple uh, uh, convolutional neural networks, uh, the performance wouldn't be increased. Thus, we try to utilize a uh, graph based convolutional neural network, GCN, and we successfully achieve the uh, performance. And uh, it, we, we, uh, it is uh, independent of the number of uh, access point. And uh, if, uh, but uh, uh, I guess it is a very important, prob uh, important question. And uh, uh, this is just, uh, <laughs> Uh, beyond our uh, beyond the scope of this uh, uh, study, yeah. Okay, thank you for your thank answer. You for your yeah, yeah. So now time is over. So I'd like to close this webinar now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Thomas, do you have uh, any as uh, uh, informative matters? Yes. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank you for moderating the session. Mm -hmm. uh, we are very grateful for your time and moderating, uh, taking the questions and mm -hmm. introducing the presenters. And at the same time, I would like to thank all our presenters, Nakao Sensei, Yamamoto Sensei, Otan-san, 
and Adachi Sensei for introducing the two problem statements as well as the expert talks. Thank you very much. We have recordings of the past webinars, so you can check on our website. You will find all the recordings there. You can go back to the material, check where you don't understand. We have also the presentations available. We will make this webinar as well, as well as the presentations available on the event page. So please be on the lookout. Otherwise, you can join us on our Slack channel. We are happy to answer all your questions as well as uh, join the challenge. So thank you very much and I wish you a very good day.